Good evening, everybody. My name is David Plyler, and I'm with the Concert Office in the Music Division at the Library of Congress. And I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, speaker for the evening, um, who will, I'm sure, uh, lead us down some very interesting paths uh, regarding tonight's program by the Borodin Quartet. Uh, Kevin Bartig is a historian of music specializing in 20th century music and culture in Eastern Europe and the United States. His books include Composing for the Red Screen, Prokofiev and Soviet Film, and Sergei Prokofiev's Alexander Nevsky, both published by Oxford University Pe Press. The American Musolo Musicological Society awarded Composing for the Red Screen a publication subvention in 2012, and the book will appear in Russian translation in 2019. Uh, with Dacia Posner, he is co-editing Three Loves for Three Oranges, uh, Goetze, Meyerhold, and Prokofiev, a collection of essays that bring together scholars from theater history, art history, musicology, Italian studies, and Slavic studies. Other publications involve music diplomacy, audiovisual aesthetics, music in the Cold War, and the reception of Russian and Soviet music in various contexts. His shorter writings include articles, reviews, and translations appearing in the Journal of Musicology, Studies in Russian and Soviet Cinema, Notes, Kritika, Journal of the Society for American Music, and Slavic Review. He has also contributed to several edited collections, including Prokofiev and, and, and His World, <clears throat> Sound, Speech, Music in Soviet and Post-Soviet Cinemas, and The Rite of Spring at 100, which won the 2018 AMS Ruth A. Soli Award for a collection of musicological essays of exceptional merit. His work has been supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the U.S. Department of Education. During 2011 and 12, he was a fellow at the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. Uh, Bartig is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of the American Musicological Society and the American Musicological Society Travel and Research Grant Committee. Uh, previously, he served on the editorial team of Three Oranges, the journal of the Sergei Prokofiev Foundation. At Michigan State, where he has taught since 2008, uh, Bartik received the MSU Teacher Scholar Award in 2010, in two, and in 2011 and 12 was a Lilly Teaching Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Bartik. Thank you, David, for that really generous introduction. Uh, and thank you um, all for being here tonight. This is a, a great turnout. Uh, as David mentioned, I was a fellow here at the library uh, once upon a time, and it's a really great honor to be back here to, um, to speak tonight. Um, so I thought I'd begin with the man whose name is all over tonight's program, Alexander Borodin. Uh, we'll hear his second quartet shortly, and in a performance by a quartet named for him, no less. Here he is in the prime of his career, uh, around 1870. Uh, string quartets and performances of string quartets were, of course, nothing new by 1870. But even at this late date in Russia, there was no homegrown quartet tradition to speak of. And we're looking at one of the people who helped to change that. By 1971, so a century later, the year Dmitry Shostakovich finished the most recent work we'll hear this evening, the standard quartet repertory was full of examples by Russian composers. So we might think of tonight's program uh, as taking us from the origins of the Russian quartet tradition in Borodin uh, to its apex in Shostakovich. Uh, most music students remember Borodin not for his two string quartets, however, but rather for his odd professional profile. He was not a professional composer. Uh, Bordine once quipped in a letter uh, that music was merely a pastime, a relaxation from more serious occupations. The most serious of these serious occupations uh, was his post as a professor of chemistry at St. Petersburg, uh, St. Petersburg's Medical Surgery Academy. Uh, and here it is uh, in Bordine's time. Uh, the composer Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, who eventually became a close friend of Bordine, Describe the effect Bordian's professional responsibilities had on his work as a composer. Uh, he, he wrote, During my visits to him, I frequently found him in his laboratory, which was connected with the apartment, sitting silently before his tubes, retorts, and other strange-looking chemical implements. When he had finished his experiments, he returned to the apartment and began to work on music. But the trouble with Bordian was that he was never at one place. 
Either he jumped up and went to see whether something had not boiled over and spoiled in the laboratory, or somebody wanted to see him. Borodin was forever attending meetings, making reports, speeches. My heart ached to see how a great genius wasted his time on such matters and could not accomplish his real work. When Google decided to mark the 185th anniversary of Borodin's birth last year with one of its so-called doodles, they portrayed him as a chemist who conjures up music. But in reality, his work as a scientist left really little time for music. If you look Borodin up in that great, unreliable trove of information, Wikipedia, you'll read that Borodin is best known for his symphonies, there are two of them, two string quartets, the symphonic poem in the steppes of Central Asia, and his opera, Prince Igor. He's probably best known for these works because it's basically all he wrote. Uh, and he, in fact, left Prince Igor unfinished, along with quite a few other pieces. The joke usually goes that no composer has managed such a legacy on the basis of such a small output. And it's no small legacy. This is the Great Hall of the Moscow Conservatory one of the Russian capital's uh, main performing venues, which, as you can see in this image here, is decorated with composer portraits, um, a sort of statement of who's who in the pantheon of greats. Bordin's, uh, it's, it's a little small, I realize, Bordin's portrait is over on the right, installed next to Richard Wagner's. From there, he peers out into the hall along with Bach, Mozart, and Haydn. Uh, not bad company for a chemist. But Bordin's career path was not actually all that unusual, at least for a music lover in mid-19th century Russia. For one, composing was not recognized as an official calling in the convoluted system of ranks that structured uh, society in Imperial Russia during Bordin's early years. And conservatories came late to Russia. Bordin was almost 30 and well into his career when the first opened. Most of Bordin's compo uh, composer contemporaries had day jobs. Modest Mussorgsky uh, occupied various civil posts in St. Petersburg. Ramsky Korskov was a naval cadet. Cesar Kui was an officer in the engineer corps, and so on. Bordin was no slouch as a scientist. Uh, this is a picture of, of him with his chemistry colleagues lined up at a natural sciences congress in uh, St. Petersburg. In 1858, he successfully defended his dissertation, which dealt with arsenic acid and phosphoric acid in chemical and toxicological behavior. Please don't ask me to explain that any further. And was sent off for further study in Heidelberg, Germany. There he rubbed elbows with Mendeleev. Uh, this is the gentleman who developed the periodic table. Uh, and he worked in the lab of Emil Erlenmeyer. Uh, this was the person who invented those triangular flasks you see in, in chemistry labs. And most importantly for our program this evening, in Heidelberg he met this woman, Yekaterina Protopopova, who soon became his wife, and much later, the inspiration for his second quartet, and more on that in a moment. Borodin's busy professional life back in St. Petersburg left time for music making only in the evenings, in informal salon-type musical gatherings, the same venues in which he got his musical start during his student days. The main attraction at those musical evenings was chamber music, which unsurprisingly became one of Borodin's primary interests as a composer. It was in these non-professional circles that he befriended Modest Mussorgsky. Uh, this fellow composer made enough of an impression on Borodin uh, that Borodin wrote down a fairly lengthy account of one of their first meetings. This was actually their, their second meeting. Um, so he, he, um, he writes, the conversation automatically turned to the subject of music. I was still very keen on Mendelssohn, and at the time hardly knew anything about Schumann at all. Mussorgsky was already acquainted with Balakirev, uh, this is uh, Mili Balakirev, the, the composer, and had an eye for all the new things that were going on in the musical world, of which I had not even the slightest idea. He played me extracts of the E flat major symphony of Schumann. Uh, this is the, the Rhenish symphony uh, number three, which at that time would have been about 10 years old. Uh, it was all new to me and I liked it. Through Mussorgsky, the Bordian found his way into a group of like-minded composers gathered together by Balakirev. 
Here they are lined up. Uh, from the left, uh, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, uh, then Mussorgsky, uh, Borodin in the middle, Cesar Kui, and over on the right is Ismili Balakirev. Uh, they're a hirsute bunch, uh, though you can spot Borodin because he's always the one with the least amount of facial hair. <laughs> Uh, the Balakirev circle, as it's known in Russia, did a lot of what Mussorgsky and Borodin did at that early meeting. They talked about music, especially Western European music. In the West, we know this group as the Mighty Handful, the Mighty Five, or maybe simply just the Five. Uh, and those are all loose translations of the name given to the group by the librarian and critic Vladimir Stasov. Uh, here is Stasov in the middle of the five in a caricature by Konstantin Makovsky uh, that I really like. Uh, he was the group's self-appointed propagandist, which is why Makovsky gave him a trumpet and a drum, and that pretty much sums up his approach to criticism, by the way. Uh, and in this caricature, uh, Kui is a fox over there on the left, uh, Balakirev is a bear, uh, Korsakov is a crab, uh, and Mussorgsky is a rooster. Uh, I'm not quite sure what boarding is. He's the gentleman floating above everybody with his left hand uh, raised. But it's Stasov who is responsible for the very popular myth that the composers of the Mighty Five were hardcore nationalists, set on carving out a national school opposed to those of Western Europe. In reality, Borodin and his colleagues carefully followed and sometimes even imitated Western European trends. Uh, Notice that when Borodin and Mussorgsky met, they immediately began speaking about Schumann and Mendelssohn, not uh, Glinka and Verstovsky, for instance. Among the five, Borodin was the one who embraced the string quartet. And here he really had to look to the West. As I mentioned earlier, there was no homegrown tradition in, in Russia. That began to change in the 1870s. Uh, Tchaikovsky wrote three quartets. Uh, Rimsky-Korsakov added another. Uh, a quartet Mikhail Glinka had written some five decades earlier was dusted off and published for the first time. Uh, and Borodin wrote two quartets, uh, the first dating from 1879 and the second that we'll hear this evening dating from 1881. The second of these two stands out for a couple of reasons. Borodin finished it in two months, which was extremely fast for him. Uh, consider that it took him five years to finish the first quartet. Uh, this is a page from the draft of the second quartet, and I realize it's a little blurry, uh, but maybe we can imagine uh, his penmanship here looking uh, especially inspired. Uh, he wrote the quartet as a 20th anniversary gift for his wife, Yekaterina, uh, and this is the connection that I mentioned earlier. One of the reasons, uh, other reasons why this quartet stands out is that it may be somewhat autobiographical. The evidence is, is kind of shape, shaky, I'll admit that, but the possibility has been tossed around enough by biographers and critics by this point that there is a tradition of reading this quartet as a very loose chronicle of Borodin's courtship and marriage. Uh, so how does this work? Uh, the quartet features a lot of dialogue between the cello and the first violin uh, spread over its four movements. Here is the opening of the first movement, um, which uh, you can see the, the melody here is in the cello if you read uh, notation. Um, and you might hear this as the first theme of a pretty typical sonata form, if you know about such things, or as a dialogue between Borodin, whose instrument was the cello, and his Yekaterina, his, his wife-to-be, on the violin in the midst of their courtship. This is a pretty textbook sonata form, so there are two main themes. The violin states the second, uh, but the key moment for the autobiographical reading comes in the recap. Sonata forms, you, you always hear the themes uh, a second time. And here the cello and the violin play together uh, for the first time. Um, not particularly remarkable from the standpoint of sonata form, 
but a significant moment if you are thinking of this uh, as a courtship of, of two instruments. So here's that moment. What I hear, um, let's skip over. What I hope is clear from these short examples and the few others I'll play in a moment is that Borodin adopted a very classical approach to the quartet in which clarity is valued. The melody is always clear, the texture is always clear, and the kind of motivic development that takes place in a sonata form is always audible. Uh, and all four, four movements of this quartet are in sonata form. The kind of instrument dialogue we saw in the first movement also happens in the third movement, uh, where we get one of uh, Borodin's most famous tunes. Here's the tune, uh, it's up in the cello here, uh, and notice that the distinctiveness of this melody has a lot to do with its shape. It snakes down from high to low, rather than following the usual arch shape of a classical melody. Borodin uses this tune uh, a little bit later to create what's essentially a little canon. Uh, the violin and cello play uh, together again, but the cello is a quarter note ahead. Uh, and unsurprisingly, this is the love duet in the courtship marriage uh, scenario. It's a great little moment. Even though these melodies may seem uh, really intensely romantic and lush, the clarity of the texture in which they're set was inspired by Western models, uh, especially those of Felix Mendelssohn. And we've already seen Borodin admitting that he was really keen on Mendelssohn. For example, here's a bit of Mendelssohn's first piano trio. This is from 1839, followed by the second movement of Borodin's quartet. Both are scherzos, and I, I think that will be obvious. So first, Mendelssohn. dancing at a pleasure garden in the autobiographical reading, uh, but clearly dancing with a Western European pedigree. Uh, a good reminder because so often Borodin is placed in a nationalist narrative that emphasizes Russian difference. Still, Borodin's second quartet struck some listeners not as a contribution to a pan-European tradition, 
but as something really exotic sounding. Uh, and by some listeners, I'm thinking in particular of Robert Wright and George Forrest, uh, who are two composer lyricists really good at adapting classical scores for films and musicals. Uh, in this case, adapting uh, should probably be in scare quotes uh, because they leaned pretty heavily on board and for Kismet, uh, their 1953 musical set in ancient Baghdad. Uh, if you don't already know about this connection, I really apologize for what I'm about to do. Uh, <laughs> Here is the main theme of the second movement of this quartet I'm picking up really where the last example left off, followed by the original Broadway cast recording of Kismet, which features uh, Doretta Morrow and uh, Alfred Drake. <laughs> think of such appropriations, Wright and Forrest are responsible for the really unusual situation in which many Americans, whether they realized it or not, could hum tunes from the second quartet. <laughs> At the moment, the boarding quartet brought the original work to the States on their international tours. Um, if boarding made it to the walls of the Moscow Conservatory's Great Hall and onto Broadway stages, thanks to a handful of finished works, that is to say, great fame, small output, we might see the opposite of Nikolai Miaskovsky, we can see here, who remains obscure despite an enormous output. He is one of the 20th century's great symphonists. He wrote 27 in total. He also wrote nine sonatas for piano, 13 string quartets, we'll hear the last of those this evening, and a host of other works. The only conspicuous absence on his resume is opera. He was a great teacher, and in his 30-year career at the Moscow Conservatory, uh, which began in 1921, uh, just really as a new generation of Soviet composers began to take shape. Uh, among his most famous students are Dmitry Kabalyevsky, uh, Vasaryan Shebulin, and Arnon Hachaturian, uh, whom you can see in this picture of Miaskovsky with a group of his students. Uh, Hachaturian is, is uh, in, the, in the back row, second from left. Also on Mieszkowski's list of accomplishments uh, is service on the editorial board of Sovietska Muzika, the main Soviet journal devoted to music, and the board of the state musical publishers. This was a uh, position of real power. Uh, he was a consultant for the Moscow Philharmonia uh, and served in the administration of the Soviet Composers Union. I'm listing all of these accomplishments to say that this was someone with no small presence in Soviet music during the 1920s through the 1940s. Miaskowski received four Stalin Prizes, uh, which was the Soviet Union's highest state honor for creative figures, and he enjoyed a substantial international presence, something that's very difficult to imagine today. He had a particularly the ardent fan in Friedrich Stock, who was the director of the Chicago Symphony, and who pro programmed uh, 30 Miaskowski symphonies in the years leading up to uh, the Second World War, if you can believe that. Uh, but history has not been kind to Miaskowski's legacy. Although it's now possible to find recordings of many of his works, 
Live performances like we'll hear this evening are exceedingly rare. Russian critics often attribute this lack of fame to uh, his almost pathological modesty and understatement. Uh, and at least one of them has called Miaskovsky the most underrated of the last century's pro prominent composers. For many observers in Western Europe and the United States, Miaskovsky developed as a composer in a way that seemed disconcertingly Soviet. He seemed uh, to begin as a promising young modernist in the 1920s, only to become a conservative disappointment in the Stalinist 1930s and 1940s. This attitude is based on contrasts like the following. Uh, so I'll play you first a few moments from Miaskovsky's 10th symphony. This is from 1927, followed by the opening of the 13th quartet, which we'll hear this evening, which dates from 1949. So here is the symphony. I've chosen my examples carefully, of course, uh, but next to the symphony, the quartet seems as if it's been scrubbed clean of all chromaticism and dissonance. Many Western observers, especially during the Cold War, became convinced that that kind of transformation was either imposed by Stalinist bureaucrats or worse, resulted from a composer trying to conform. Boris Schwartz, who wrote a hefty English language account of Soviet music at the height of the Cold War, that really remained the gold standards uh, for, for, for decades, uh, summed up Miaskovsky's path, uh, path as a move away from a subjective style, that is music as self-expression, to an objective style, communication with a vast audience. For Schwartz, these things, self-expression and appeal to a broad audience, are incompatible and one must choose. All that really is, is a paraphrase of Schoenberg's famous quip that if it is art, it's not for all, and if it is for all, it's not for art. <laughs> During the Cold War, that attitude meant a lot of music coming from Eastern Europe was unpalatable for many Western critics. Even though the Miaskowski Quartet we'll hear shortly, number 13, came nearly seven decades after Borodin's second, the two pieces have a lot in common. They both use uh, the classic four movement structure of the quartet, a first movement sonata, a second movement scherzo, a slow third movement, Borodin's is a nocturne, uh, Miaskowski's is a chorale, uh, and a concluding fast movement, Borodin's is another sonata, Miaskowski's is a rondo. Moreover, Borodin would have found most of Miaskowski's harmonic language familiar, despite two generations and the rise of musical modernism that separate the composers. In musicological discussions in the West, especially after 1945, this brand of conservatism was usually held up against its seeming ideological opposite, the high modernism and total serialism of composers like Boulez and Stockhausen, who were felt to epitomize uh, individual creative freedom. If musical style hadn't been so deeply politicized on either side of the Iron Curtain, it might have been easier to see that Miaskowski, in fact, has a lot in common with the so-called neo-romantics, composers like Virgil Thompson, Francis Poulenc, and Samuel Barber. Neoclassicism implies a connection with tradition, and Miaskowski was certainly deeply rooted in the Russian 19th century thanks to his training. At the St. Petersburg Conservatory, he was a student of Rimsky-Korsakov, uh, and also of Korsakov's own student, Anatoly Lyadov. Uh, and as a side note, Miaskowski, like Borodin, seemed destined for a career outside of music. He initially followed in the footsteps of his military engineer father, studying in the cadet corps and at the St. Petersburg Military and Engineering College. 
He didn't enter Rimsky-Korsakov's class until age 25, and even then remained a reserve officer. Uh, and this meant that he was mobilized during World War I and dispatched to the Austrian front. Uh, and we have this remarkable photo from that time. This is uh, 1915. At the time this photo was taken, Mieskowski had already begun working on three string quartets. But the real burst of quartet activity for him came late in life, during the 1940s, when he turned out a quartet nearly every year, including the 13th, which turned out to be his final opus. At the risk of maybe overdetermining the way you'll hear this quartet this evening, I'll add that the final two and a half years of Mieskowski's life were exceptionally sad. He was sick with cancer and also fell victim to the so-called anti-formalist campaign, a bureaucratic effort to draw clear ideological boundaries between East and West as the Cold War escalated. This was the really infamous moment when Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Mieskowski, and others were publicly accused in 1948 of doing harm to the Soviet state by writing inaccessible formalist music. The charges were absurd and uh, political. Uh, Mieskowski, for example, had only just received the Stalin Prize for his cello concerto two years earlier. This crude attack, however, only encouraged Mieskowski to work harder. And in his final year, he finished another symphony, number 27, and the 13th Quartet, both works for which he would receive Stalin Prizes, though they were awarded after his death. This is the first page of the 13th Quartet. Uh, if you don't read Russian, the dedication at the top is to the Beethoven Quartet, which premiered the work at the Moscow Conservatory on October 21st, 1950, two months after Mieskowski's passing. This was, in fact, the ninth Mieskowski Quartet the uh, Beethoven's premiered. The group had been active since uh, about 1923. Beginning in 1940, they also worked closely with Shostakovich, who gave them the premieres of all of his subsequent quartets, many of which are dedicated to individual members of the Beethoven Quartet. For example, the quartet we'll hear this evening is dedicated to the Beethoven violist, uh, Vadim Borisovsky, uh, and not surprisingly, it has a big viola part. But another Moscow-based quartet began performing in 1946 as the Quartet of the Moscow Philharmonic. In less than a decade, they became major competition for the Beethovens. And already in 1955, they launched their first international tour under their new name, the Borodin Quartet. The membership has changed over the years, of course, but just barely in the case of the group's cellist. The quartet's current cellist, uh, Vladimir uh, Bolshin, is only the second. His predecessor, uh, Valentin Berlinsky, whom you see in this photo here, performed with the group for an astonishing 62 years. The Borodins, like the Beethovens, became close with Shostakovich. In fact, Shostakovich seemed to prefer uh, working with the Borodins in some cases. Here's how the Soviet composer uh, Edis and Denisov described it, um, and this, uh, as best I can guess, is around 1953. So he writes, uh, Dmitry Dmitrievich is satisfied with the Beethoven's performance of the fifth quartet, but he says they don't play the fourth quartet well. He wanted to give the premiere to the Borodins, but the Beethovens announced that this would lead to a break in their relations. They were offended. Dmitry Dmitrievich said, I don't like relations to be too, uh, between people to be too friendly or too hostile. Relationships should be kept simple. Uh, and for Denisov, uh, he wrote this explains much about Shostakovich's behavior. Uh, the Borodin's venerable cellist, uh, Valentin Berlinsky, recalled in an interview just how close the relationship with Shostakovich could be. Uh, and in this following passage, I'll quote, he describes preparing a performance of Shostakovich's piano quintet. Uh, and he writes, I remember various details of the rehearsals which took place at Shostakovich's home. In the prelude, he asked us not to make a ritenuto, despite it being marked in the score. But ritenuto is written here, we exclaimed. He came up to us very nervously, took out a pen, and crossed out the marking in every part. <laughs> Rudolf Barshai was the viola player in the quartet at this time. In the finale, there is an imitation between the cello and the viola. It's in the score now, but it wasn't then. The cello and the viola were supposed to play together, but Barshai made a mistake and came in after I did. Shostakovich stopped playing and said, 
please mark it the way you played it just now. In all the editions published after that date, that is how it's printed. Perhaps because he had not one, but two world-class ensembles to work with, the string quartet became central to the second half of Shostakovich's career. And all but the first two of his 15 quartets date from the post-World War II period. It's even rumored that he hoped to write a quartet in each of the 24 major and minor keys. He managed to pull this off, this Bach-like task off, with 24 preludes and fugues for the piano in 1951, but he never completed the far more ambitious quartet project. The 13th is in B flat minor, but you wouldn't really know it apart from the opening uh, key signature. The viola plays alone here, and if you read notation, you'll notice that Shostakovich exhausts all tr uh, 12 chromatic pitches before he returns and repeats that initial B flat. Uh, and of course, this is alto clef, so apologies to all the non violists out there. This is, for all intents and purposes, a 12-tone row of the type made famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, uh, by Arnold Schoenberg. Shostakovich uses 16 such rows in this quartet, though never in the way Shostakovich, uh, excuse me, Schoenberg, too many S names, uh, Schoenberg and his disciples would have deployed them. For one, they're used only melodically, as you can see here, never to form harmonic structures. Despite some really deliciously dissonant moments in this quartet, there's always a pull toward a tonal center, and that pull is exactly what Schoenberg tried to avoid. So what's with these 12-tone rows? They weren't new for Shostakovich. He'd used them before, most notably in his 12th quartet. Nor were they particularly radical for the USSR in 1971, when Shostakovich finished this quartet. A younger group of Soviet composers had already done far more controversial things with Schoenberg's example already in the 1960s. But we have an explanation straight from Shostakovich's mouth. Um, so he writes here that, as far as the use of strictly technical devices, such as musical systems, as dodecophony, so the, the 12-tone system, or aleatory is concerned, everything in good measure. If, let's say, a composer sets himself the obligatory task of writing dodecaphonic music, then he artificially limits his possibilities, his ideas. The use of elements from these complex systems is fully justified if it is dictated by the concept of the composition. You know, to a certain extent, I think the formula, the end justifies the means, is valid in music. All means, all of them, if they contribute to the end objective. I think the end Shostakovich was after in the 13th Quartet was a chromaticism that he could use to create what is really one of his gloomiest atmospheres. And you'll hear this gloominess at the beginning and the end of the quartet's single movement. Uh, and by the way, Shostakovich was all over the board here. The 11th Quartet had seventh move, uh, seven movements, uh, the 12th Quartet had two movements, and uh, in the 13th we just had this, this single movement. Um, but this single movement has a clear five-part arch structure. And by arch, I mean that the beginning and end are similar. So if you think of this in, in numbers one and five, uh, two and four are similar. Uh, and then there's a really unusual uh, central section that I'll talk about in a second here. Uh, one and five involve some exceedingly dark counterpoint that grows from this initial viola line. The second and fourth parts involve an unusually insistent three-note figure, bump, 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 uh, a very Shostakovich-like gesture that turns into these very dissonant chords here. Even if you don't read music, you can imagine that this is uh, a, a very loud and grating moment. But in my opinion, the focal point is this very odd middle section where the tapping implied by these three-note figures turns into actual tapping. 
Here, just above the viola line in the bottom right corner, Shostakovich uh, indicates that the player is to hit the body of the instrument with the wooden part of the bow. The result is an eerie knock, uh, or I should say knocking, uh, because it happens throughout the section. Uh, and this is really one of Shostakovich's strangest soundscapes, because that knocking comes over a cello line that resembles a jazz groove. <laughs> players try to avoid hitting their instruments with hard objects, uh, at least the ones I know. And the 13th has always presented a challenge from this perspective. Uh, I'm not really sure what we'll see this evening, but the most creative workaround I've heard about is to perform the knocks on a second, uh, far less expensive set of instruments. <laughs> Uh, and by way of a conclusion, I'd like to offer something of a footnote concerning a single note of the 13th Quartet. Uh, because it's a rare moment when we can, so to speak, look over Shostakovich's shoulder as he's composing. Uh, Fyodor Druzhinin, uh, the Beethoven Quartet violist, um, the one who was in place around 1970, uh, tells this story about one of his many encounters with Shostakovich. Uh, and this comes from an art article uh, Dujinin wrote for the cellist uh, Elizabeth Wilson. He writes, we were recording the 12th quartet in the church where Melodia had its studio. This was the um, uh, central record label of the Soviet Union. I had arrived a little early to warm up. At the time, I was learning Kodai's transcription of Bach's chromatic fantasy, which has an enormous number of arpeggios of every kind in it. I was playing with some panache uh, and playing a diminished chord uh, that went up to a high B-flat in the third octave, playing fortissimo, as marked, with loads of vibrato. <laughs> familiar grating voice behind me. That's a B flat, a B flat, said Dmitri Dmitrievich, who had unobtrusively crept up behind me. I affirmed that it was indeed. Well, try it once more if you don't mind, he asked. I whirled up the arpeggio again. Yes, now sustain, sustain it with vibrato. It's not a harmonic, is it? Well, well, yes, yes, that's how, he murmured in response to some private thought. Then he asked if I could land straight on that note without the preceding passage. I answered that it was possible, and indeed that it was more difficult to come down from it than to, to, to go up to it. Sometime later, we received the new score of the 13th Quartet. We had no inkling of its existence. I saw the quartet ends with a long viola solo in the high register, known jokingly as the Heights of Eternal Rosin. And the last note was that same B flat which is then passed on to the first and second violins to give the effect of a snowballing crescendo. And here is that high B flat uh, as reimagined by Shostakovich. Uh, and this begins just at the end of the, the first line here. It would be uh, natural to ask what all of this means. The 12 tone rows, the knocking, the jazz groove, the soaring B flat. In context might yield some clues. For instance, the quartet followed the 14th symphony, a setting of 11 poems for soprano and bass soloists. All of these poems concern aspects of mortality and death. Moreover, Olga Digonskaya, uh, an archival research who, researcher who has dug up some fascinating stuff about Shostakovich recently, 
has shown that Shostakovich decided to add the quartet's gloomy bookends, uh, the first and fifth parts, only after composing a lamentation for the film version of uh, Shakespeare's uh, King Lear. Uh, and if you're into Soviet film, this is the famous Kozintsev version. Uh, Shostakovich also surely had his own mortality in mind. By the late 1960s, an advanced case of poliomyelitis had sapped his energy and robbed him of his ability to, to play the piano. So perhaps like Bordian II, this quartet uh, is um, somewhat autobiographical, especially given its dark uh, atmosphere and bleak sonorities. But then again, Shostakovich didn't give us a text or a program, and he could have. And as was his habit, he remained tight-lipped about questions of meaning. Instead, he leaves us with evocative and really even kind of puzzling music. And on the question of what it's all about, he turns to us, the, the audience. Um, so I'll end there. I'm happy to take uh, any questions you have. Um, but, but thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. <laughs> So there's a, there's a microphone if anyone has has questions. Um, you talked about the 12 tone row at the start of the 13th quartet, and you distinguished between using the melodic aspect of 12 tone music and the harmonic aspect. Could you say a little more about that? Because that's the first I've heard of. It's a very interesting idea to me. Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, Schoenberg felt that one of his um, one of his great achievements is to uh, get rid of what he called the horizontal and vertical dimensions in music. So, if you think of your your, your typical uh, classical era piece, you have a melody and, and accompaniment, the horizontal and the vertical. Uh, Schoenberg wanted to get rid of that, so he has these twelve tone rows, uh, which function as collects, uh, collections of pitches. Uh, they can be melodic; you can state them individually or you can clump them together in, in harmonies. Uh, and he sees these as, as exactly the same thing, even though they sometimes happen together, um, sometimes happen melodically. Uh, and, and students in uh, music theory, when they learn how to analyze this, they always joke about the amoebas, they call them, because you find the row and then you draw a circle around it. And sometimes they're so convoluted that they look like amoebas sitting on the, uh, on the, on the score here. But, but in the case of this, uh, this quartet, uh, Shostakovich, and, and really any time Shostakovich uses a 12-tone row, it's always melodically. The pitches happen. Uh, and basically all he's doing is using all 12 chromatic pitches before he repeats, uh, repeats any of those. Um, as, as sort of a little game to play with himself, I think. I have a question about Mioskowski. Um He was a, an older classmate and friend of Prokofiev's. Mm -hmm. And um, violinists know his violin concerto, which in large part, large part just sounds like Prokofiev, but the lyrical Prokofiev. Um, is there any Mioskowski work that you can think of that has the um, mechanistic, lyrical dichotomy of Prokofiev? You played for us a modernist piece, mm -hmm. um, but um, in the West we don't know it very well. I've been looking. I've not been able to find anything. Um, although Prokofiev uh, wrote that he writes just like I. Mm -hmm. uh, Nothing comes to mind. Uh, if we were to compare the two composers, uh, Mioskowski is always um, uh, much more of a contrapuntal uh, composer. Uh, he's interested in, in, in weaving lines together, uh, whereas Prokofiev really cultivated this mechanistic uh, sound. Um, uh, and he, he even says uh, he, he thought this up when he first heard uh, the, the Schumann Toccata for piano, uh, which is one of these um, uh, perpetual motion pieces that just seems to go over and over and over. Uh, and he really cultivated that sound. Uh, Mioskowski and Prokofiev uh, were, uh, I, I would say they were friends, uh, but they had at times a very antagonistic relationship. Uh, Prokofiev often thought Mioskowski was hopelessly conservative. 
uh, and, and Miaskowski, for, for his uh, turn, being a very modest person, uh, found Prokofiev sometimes to be a little brash and, and self-absorbed. Uh, self um, so they often commented on each other's music. Uh, and in fact, there's uh, just you know, an incredible, incredible uh, collection of letters uh, they wrote to each other constantly. Uh, but in terms of real clear influence on each other's music, I think that's a little uh, more difficult to find. Uh, to bring it down to the mundane level, um, was there a royalty issue with Kismet and uh, those Bordin melodies? Because it's so obvious, and I don't know what the law was at, at that time or how it would, you know. Uh, that is a good question uh, that I don't know the answer to, but my suspicion would be that they didn't bother to um, uh, to uh, to do anything with it because uh, uh, the Soviet Union at the time uh, in 1953 did not participate in international copyright. Wow. Um, uh, they believed as a socialist country, music belonged to the people, uh, and they were um, they were really resistant to the idea of royalties and, and copyright. Uh, and this, this created huge problems for musical exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union because, uh, of course, American composers who wanted their pieces played in the Soviet Union wanted their royalties and nobody was going to pay them there because the copyright laws were not, were not recognized. So, so I, I, I don't quite know the answer to that question, but my suspicion would be that um, they, they, they just borrowed away. Fordian was well out of commission by that. Yeah. That, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The Phillips Collection is doing the complete string quartets of Weinberg mm -hmm. starting, I think, in May. And how would you place Weinberg in this tradition since Weinberg was a very close friend of Shostakovich, his neighbor, and composed 17 quartets and continued after Shostakovich's death? Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of this. That's, that's great. Great to know and great to, that his music is getting some um, some attention because uh, it certainly deserves that. Um, Weinberg uh, grew up in Poland and he uh, actually had, was planning on attending Curtis. He wanted to come to the States and make make a career here, uh, and he had the um, his, his timing was uh, exceptionally bad. Um, he graduated from conservatory in Poland right around the time uh, the Nazis invaded. Uh, so he fled not to the United States, but he fled uh, to the Soviet Union, uh, first to Belarus, and then, then eventually made his way to, to Moscow, where he met Shostakovich. Uh, and Shostakovich was very much, uh, even though the age different, what the difference wasn't that great, was, was sort of a father figure. Uh, and th there is a lot of, of uh, Weinberg that sounds a great deal like Shostakovich. There, that's an instance where you can see uh, really, really clear um, uh, influence of, of one composer on, on another. Um, and in fact, there, um, there, there have been moments when uh, a Weinberg Quartet uh, uh, has, has popped up on the radio the rare time it happens. And uh, for a moment, I kind of wondered, what, what, which Shostakovich Quartet is this? And um, it turns out to be Weinberg. Um, so there is a really clear cl uh, connection there between the two of them. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. And enjoy the concert.